uh, I basically want to go through and talk about kind of the, the main, the, the, the most important development of, of experiments that led to our knowledge at, at the point where quantum physics was, um, began to be developed. By the way, um, the work for quantum physics really kind of outright began around about um, the, the 1900s. So uh, about the turn of the century is when the, these experiments that we start seeing started getting weirder and weirder. And the ones I'm going to talk about today are, you've probably heard about through your chemistry class, like literally every single one of these was the recipient of a Nobel Prize. Um, some of them for chemistry, in fact, though. Um, and there's only one person who won two Nobels. And it was not any of the he's on the list. So, um, and so hopefully you know who that is already. But so, um, so I want to go through the, the most important development of, of the experiments that guided where the theory that we began interpreting came from. And the, so the state of knowledge around about 1905, 1910. And I, I'm going to do it at, I'm going to do my best to do a historical development. And if I'm wrong in this, it's, it's only because this is the, the order that it should have been discovered either way. So uh, to start off with here, and the, the first person that's, you know, as I was alluding to, uh, Marie Curie, who is the only person on this list who won two Nobels. Uh, and so her Nobel was... I'll try to list them here, which it's kind of cool to, to see the development of this, and they weren't all necessarily in chronological order, if I recall. But her Nobel was in 1903 um, for physics, and then 1911 for chemistry. So, um, by the way, her... Let's see, I'll just... Um, the, the Nobel in physics was essentially for the discovery of radioactivity, and then in chemistry was for the discovery of two new, what, what we understand are radioactive elements. Um, she didn't actually understand what exactly the radioactivity particles were or what it fundamentally was, which is part of the whole rest of this development here. But um, that was actually explained by another person the, uh, on our list later here. And so specifically her work that, that we're most concerned in was around 1897. And this was, so she was literally the one who coined the term radioactivity. Which, you know, to me, like, go back literally a hundred years ago from when you were born. Um, and, you know, think about, like, the fact that the radioactivity was not a word that, that your parents had ever heard. Radioactivity is not a word you had heard growing up. That all of a sudden you're, you know, 25 and, you know, newspaper says radioactivity discovered or whatever. Like, that doesn't make any sense the way it would make sense to us today. Like, you have to, like, it's, it's the same thing as seeing a, a, a headline of you know, uh, Nerdelbin discovered. You know, all of a sudden you need to learn about what that is, and that might become the most important development in physics. It might be Nobel, like, doubly Nobel worthy. You know, who knows? But that was a brand new thing for them at the day. And um, she all, the, the basis for the name here, by the way, was rays, R-A-Y-S, like, like rays of light or, or rays of energy. And we now understand that radioactivity specifically is the same thing as small nuclei, or electrons streaming out. Two different types of radioactivity. <coughs> but the importance of that, though, is that she understood that there's something going on inside matter that we can't really explain. That if there is, you know, so we understood, like, the, the you know, the periodic table of the elements, and we understood generally how to categorize them, but we didn't understand uh, principally what the, the physical, like, layout was. She was the first one to hint that there was something really interesting inside of it that's not just like basically a pudding of matter. If, and that's kind of the, the, the plum pudding model is kind of how some people have phrased how, how uh, matter was thought of fundamental, fundamentally before, just as a big soup of blah. She was the first one that showed there's actually like individual parts that can be shot out, basically. So, um, then, so shortly after, she, she kind of made her discovery of radioactivity and then she went on to do many more discoveries and of course, uh, you all know she didn't understand the, you know, the health implications of it. We, we now, of course, do. So she was prone to x-rays and, and radioactive particles for much of her career, which is why she died. Um, and, um, but so uh, shortly after that, though, J.J. Uh, Thompson was, let's see. So, you know, it's, you always just see J period, J period Thompson. And um, he, again, uh, he won a Nobel. This, his Nobel was in 1906. 
and I'll just write P, so 1906 he won the physics Nobel. And his work specifically, um, he did work, his work a, a, decade, a decade earlier at the same time as Curie. Um, all of this is like absolutely fascinating, you know, historical science that, that if you ever get a chance, like there's so many different, you know, like um, kind of, you know, novel type of, I mean a novel, but like, you know, popular science books about like how at the turn of the century, like so many brilliant minds were all like it working at probably the highest level of any, you know, uh, multinational collaboration in the history of the world. Um, and so it, it was mainly throughout Europe at the time, although there were American physicists, uh, Franklin among one, uh, many of them. So uh, Thompson specifically was the first one to, um, I'll get a little more technical, but the first one to, to essentially discover, discover the electron. And I don't love that, but that's basically what it was. Um, more precisely, and, and we'll, we'll talk a little more about that later on, um, but more precisely, what, what he did was he was able to design a, 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 a mechanical apparatus that actually measured, it, it was able to determine that there are individual negative charges that as they move at a certain speed, they can be deflected by electric and magnetic fields. And he was able to specifically determine how much charge they had per mass. So I will write that. Um, so it wasn't necessarily the discovery of the electron, but it was the charge to mass ratio of the electron, which to be historically accurate, um, that was a huge, a, a huge deal because all you have to do now is measure what is the fundamental charge. And you now have, like, what is the, the smallest mass of the smallest particle that we know of in the universe um, at that time? And yeah, it's still, yeah, yeah, so. Uh, no, neutrino mass, they're smaller, I'm sorry. So anyway, um, Thompson, at about the same time as Curie, saw that there were actually individually, um, we, we refer to them as negative charges, and that was due to Ben Franklin, who I'm not going to list here. Um, he didn't, I don't think he won a Nobel, but... Um, he was a, a great experimentalist, but he didn't necessarily get to the heart of the experimental, or sorry, the, of, the, of the theoretical framework, which is what all of these people did for the development of nuclear and for particle physics. So, um, after Thompson uh, measured specifically the charge to mass ratio, that basically how, mi how many kilograms per coulomb of charge the electron has, then that's when the next person here came along, and this was Millikan. And uh, to be entirely honest, I forget his first name. Um, and you always hear him in the, con in the context of um, the Millikan oil drop experiment. And because literally what he did is he made droplets of oil that had like, you know, static charge uh, contained in them. And he measured like how much, you know, how much charge each, each one had. So I'll, I'll get to why that's important in a second. But so Millikan won his Nobel in, it was physics again, right? Yeah, physics in 1923. And uh, specifically, it was based on his work done uh, a decade and a half earlier in 1906. And specifically, he measured the mass of the electron, basically. I'll just try it like that. And, it, and it's important to note that he used Thompson's uh, Thompson's ratio here because he effectively measured how much charge a, a single electron has and then once he knew that charge you multiply it by the mass per charge ratio you flip that there and you get out what is the mass of the individual particle and you know I mean that's just it's astounding that you know really by you know think what technology was like 1906 like how long had electricity been kind of worldwide like you know f you know fewer than five decades so, you know, it's amazing we went from basically no electricity to knowing how much mass a fundamental particle of the universe is. And we still, to this day, believe that the electron is a fundamental particle. Um, there are various theories like string theory that say that um, it, fundamental particles are themselves little tiny strings of energy that are wound up and vibrate a certain way. But even so, the electron is itself a, a fundamental string, if string theory itself is correct. Uh, which string theory, by the way, is based very highly on quantum physics. 
Um, I'm going to pause here just because I need a drink of water. But um, so that's where that's where we're at. We have up to the discovery of the mass of the electron, and then we can build the bigger picture here in a moment. Okay, so moving on to Rutherford. Now, first of all, Rutherford's Nobel was uh, in chemistry, and he won that in 1908. Now, if you notice the work that uh, that I'm, I'm going to you know talk about here, which you, you're probably familiar with, is the gold foil experiment, which is what I'll write here. But um, the work that he did was, in fact, after he won his Nobel, which is you know interesting in itself. So he was already a Nobel laureate be before he began his most famous research. So um, you know, go figure. But specifically, he won his Nobel for explaining what uh, uh, Madame Curie had, had discovered herself, but not really been able to describe. And he was the one who identified there's two separate types of radiation. There's what we call alpha and beta radiation. And turns out that, um, that the alpha, sorry, well, we'll go with the, uh, yeah, the alpha radiation is in fact the same thing as a helium nucleus. That a helium nucleus we, we now understand, you know, 120 years later, a helium nucleus is, in fact, two protons and two neutrons linked together. So that's what we call a helium-4 isotope. It's the most stable isotope of helium. But Rutherford was the one who identified that that's exactly what gets spit out of, of uranium or plutonium or radium, or any, which, by the way, the word radium, go figure what that's based on. Uh, so all of the, and radon, all of those things spit out little tiny helium nuclei, and that's what we call radioactive decay. So you can decay from plutonium, which is, I believe, atomic number 96. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. But you can decay from plutonium 96 by spitting out a helium nucleus, going down to uranium 94. Or whatever it is, there, there's a difference of two. And that's really, really important for astronomy. But I'm not going to go there here. So anyway, that was Rutherford's research. Um, the other, um, the beta particle for radiation, by the way, was um, what we now understand to be what Thompson had discovered, the electron. So he didn't, they didn't exactly know it at the time, but one of the two types of radioactivity that was triggering her like ele electric charge gauges was electrons that, was, that were being spit out. So that was Rutherford, and I don't, I don't think he was the one that identified that particular part of it. But um, Anyway, so his research... That, that is more relevant to the development of quantum theory um, was that, the, that in addition to what we understood to be at least a negative charge in the sense of we had to assign a positive and negative, um, we, we knew there was a little tiny, very low mass negative particle that was out there. And again, we understood this to be at about 1906, so before he did this work. But the rest of that, uh, the positive charge that we knew had to be there and the rest of the mass that we knew that, that had to be there, um, we, we always understood to be kind of in just this soup or this gelatinous like mixture, and then you had the negativeness, the, the little quantized things that were uh, swimming about. Um, he was the one that proved that wrong by his famous gold, gold foil experiment, where he took a very thin foil of, of gold atoms, and um, he shot uh, high-energy particles at it, and what he expected was that if it's this gelatinous mixture, that those particles are going to go through almost entirely undeflected. Like, they might swerve a little bit, but that the beam of particles that he sends through are all going to more or less, you know, go onto the target on the opposite side with very little, you know, spread or deflection. And what he found was that of those, of let's say 99 uh, particles he sent through, of 100 particles he sent through, 99 would do just that, <clears throat> excuse me, but every once in a while, 1%, which isn't that, well, that, no, it's a little bit higher, than that, lower than that, but 1% or so would somehow or another hit the deflector way back here behind where it started, or at this extreme angle, you know, 70 degrees away from where it started, you know, or maybe 80, 90 degrees like that. So instead of going, you know, just through this kind of almost gelatinous mixture, somehow bounces right back with no explanation. And I, I think it's been described as, you know, if you were to throw a bowling ball at a big, you know, paper, uh, a, a big paper banner, something like just a very thin paper, you know, like door covering, if that bowling ball were to bounce right back at you is kind of how, the, how this was unexpected. And ultimately, this was, of course, the discovery of that high mass density, high charge density region that occupies a tiny fraction of the, of the volume 
but almost the entirety of the mass of that atom. In other words, the nucleus. So there has to be some very high density clump of matter at the center to bounce particles back that wouldn't happen if it was just a, a low density spread out mixture of mass and charge. And it, not always credited, and for whatever reason, like in a lot of textbooks, you don't see this last, this last guy mentioned here. Um, but after Rutherford, we, we're not quite there to the modern model, modern model of the atom. We have, you know, an electron, we have a central high density, um, you know, a positively charged area, we knew that. But it wasn't actually until the 30s, and specifically with uh, uh, Chadwick, who effectively realized that at the center of that nucleus had to be, um, you, you had charge that was quantized, but for each charge that you had quantized, you, could, you had different amounts of mass that could be at that same charge level. What, I mean, and, and hopefully you understand what I'm talking about here. So if you have, for example, um, we'll say, I was going to use gold, but I forget how many atoms that has, how many protons. Um, if you have carbon, now you know that you can do experiments and find out that carbon, and we knew, has eight positive, you know, charge units at, the, at its nucleus. And of that, of those nuclei of carbon, you can now, you can now weigh them. Turns out that those, the, the, the nuclei of carbon that you have in front of you will have incrementally separated amounts of mass. Some of those atoms will have a little bit less, some will have a little bit more, some will have even more, and now there's an average, but what he discovered, in fact, was isotopes. And because he recognized that you can change the mass in by almost exactly the same as the mass between, for example, um, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, six, seven, eight, um, you know, element six, seven, eight, um, you can add, you know, individual mass units by adding a proton at a time. The neutron that he, you know, essentially discovered had almost identical mass to the proton, except it added nothing in math, uh, in charge. So um, his Nobel was for this, and the Nobel was in, what was it, 1935 in physics. And for the work that he did in 1932... <coughs> which I, I believe he was a British scientist, um, and this is, um, you know, literally a worldwide co uh, compendium here, but um, Curie was, of course, American, um, and the first woman to win a Nobel, too. But, uh, so in 1932, he was the one that effectively discovered not only the nucleus, but the neutron. And one more thing, um, we're, we're good scientists now. Nucleus, the... C becomes, uh, the C comes before the L, so it's nucleus, not, uh, not uh, U between them, so it's not nuclear, it's nuclear. There's only, there's no, there's only one U, and it's not after the C, so um, <laughs> certain famous people, maybe presidents, have always irked me in the pronunciation. Um, so anyway, this is basically a story of where our modern theory of the atom comes from. And these are the, you know, what I would say are the five most seminal experiments. And again, each one of them Nobel worthy, so, so it's worth mentioning. Now, quantum theory itself, the, the theoretical development, which was taking all of these experiments and then now adding, adding other experiments and trying to put like a mathematical framework is where things get really off the wires. Uh, and that itself earned a number, a number of Nobels. Um, Einstein, that, that was actually what his Nobel was for, for the, what we call the photoelectric effect. Uh, Max Planck won a Nobel. Um, let's see, uh, Heisenberg, Schrodinger, um, like basically it's the list of all the famous names you've heard have all won Nobels for mainly their contribution to quantum physics. So there's a reason why this is so vitally important, um, you know, and it, it's echoed by the number of Nobels per, you know, category, even still today. You know, when I was at MIT, I, I had a professor who, um, was, won his Nobel, uh, for a quantum effect that he measured in his lab. So, um... This is where we're at um, uh, experimentally, and I think next lecture we're going to go into some of the more, uh, we're going to go into a little bit more detail about how, how each of these experiments worked, um, but then I want to go on to a little bit more, uh, 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 some beginning other experiments aside from this that start to show that not only are there atoms and particles, but they behave really strangely.
So that's really all I have uh, uh, here for today.